tell us a little bit about gardening today. What's going on? Well, we're coming to the end of the summer and into the beginning of the autumnal uh, season. We've actually had kind of a weird uh, circumstance with the, the smoke weather a while back, which kind of suddenly brought on a seasonal change for us. Uh, we're temporarily having uh, some warm weather, at least uh, until the weekend, but uh, it's, it's definitely uh, becoming fall. I noticed uh, at my place and around town that a lot of uh, plants had uh, some fairly severe reaction to the smoke. Uh, there were a number of them that uh, the flower tissue all died on them. Uh, some of them come back into bloom. Uh, a number of trees uh, were hit and uh, uh, some of them lost all of their foliage. Some of them had uh, high percentage of the foliage turned yellow, but then it fell off and now they're green again because some of the leaves weren't affected. And I've had three or four of my uh, perennial plants that uh, just completely browned up in it and others that didn't. So, but the, the sudden change in, in temperature and light level and the, the air quality uh, definitely had an effect on things. I've heard that it's really affected the grapes. Some of the uh, vineyards uh, we're having an issue with their grapes not being accepted now because of the smoke. And, uh, and that made me wonder. So I have some tomatoes that are outside I've been growing. Um, I figured if I took them in and washed them off, they'd be okay to eat. I didn't notice a difference in any taste or smell. No, generally not. But uh, with the grapes, they have literally tons and tons of them. And I don't think they do much of any washing of them. And uh, so, like, I think it was two years ago, they had a, a big issue with uh, smoke on, on the wine grapes. But I got a feeling this year, there's so much of it across the West that they may just decide that this year's the year of the fire wine. And we all <laughs> consider it part that's, of the terroir. <laughs> that's kind of what I thought, since, you know, it wasn't just any one particular vineyard. It's going to affect all of them. Dale, I had a question about the holly bush has lost most of its leaves. The berries are there now for the robins. They don't look very good for Christmas ornaments. I wondered if we should do anything with the tree. It's probably 30, 35 years old. And I wondered at the time, maybe it needed water is what happened. So yeah, what so care would I do? Well, I would uh, you know, give it a, a good deep watering. That uh, would probably help a little bit. Uh, but I don't think that it dried out. If, it, if it's 20, 30 years old, it's got a good deep root system and it, it won't need any additional watering during oh. the year. Probably just the, uh, uh, the condition that the foliage was at, that it took in enough uh, toxins that then the plant decided to shed them. I don't think you're going to have a long-term effect from it, but you might want to uh, make a point of giving it a, a feeding this winter or early spring. Uh, mm -hmm. I wouldn't do it right now. You don't want it to push out uh, tender growth before uh, winter, but in the long run, you, you probably do want to give it a feeding before spring. And I, I'd look for one that has a, a reasonable amount of potassium. That's the, the third of the three numbers. So something, something fairly equal across would probably be good. And, and it's a bit early for the, the berries to have good color. Now, I've, I've got a really good crop on my old uh, holly tree and they're, they're just kind of that early orangey uh, stage, but they'll, they'll redden up quite a bit. But I also noticed that there was uh, uh, a fair amount of the leaves around the, uh, the berries that fell off. When you say about an equal uh, triple 16, Possibly, although that's that's kind of your high test ag fertilizer. I'm thinking something more like a five 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 is probably oh. uh, is something that's got trace minerals and and other things. You know, you, you're sort of looking for a flower or vegetable type uh, fertilizer, not a not a oh. pasture fertilizer. Although you know, triple sixteen with liquid fish probably wouldn't hurt. You know, be you just want to be cautious in how you you spread the high test material around. Well, what kind of things should we be doing now for getting ready for the fall and winter, Dale? Well, this is, this is the time to be doing uh, some uh, general cleanup and gathering uh, fallen leaves and so forth. Uh, the, the leaves make an excellent mulching material, but uh, if you leave them on the lawn, uh, 
they can be a problem if if they're left as a you know a solid mat. If you got a mulching mower that can chop them up, then that's a great way to work them back into the lawn. The pruning season is approaching, but we kind of want to wait until we've had a, a, a good frost, although play it by ear. There's a number of things that uh, you can tell, okay, this, this one's gone to sleep for the winter, I can prune it back, that kind of thing. So we're, we're kind of in the early cleanup uh, phase, and I figure between now and Thanksgiving is the time for uh, a major cleanup, but usually after we've had a, a good hard frost. I have a question. Uh, in terms of using the leaves as mulch, wouldn't there be the toxins from the smoke in the leaves and maybe you don't want those in the mulch? No, I don't think there's going to be that much uh, from it. The, the, uh, the small amount of, uh, of ash and smoke is probably going to cause a, a, a higher pH and it actually probably helps sweeten the soil a little bit. I don't, it, it'll, it'll be broken down by the soil microorganisms and so forth. So I, I, I don't think there's a a serious toxicity that we have to worry about. People get all excited about, oh, you know, wood ash is what we make lye out of, and that's true, <laughs> but the quantities needed are uh, much higher than what we've had. I, I think we're going to see a, a fair amount of damage from the smoke where it went inside the tissues that were still awake, like uh, a number of, uh, of plants that I had a, a vine maple that totally def defoliated. I could see several big leaf maples out in the woods that uh, totally defoliated, but I think they'll be back just, just fine again next year. I have kind of a weird question. I noticed um, recently uh, after my lawn had been mowed, uh, I've had some interesting different kinds of mushrooms growing up that I've never seen before, but just out of the blue, some kind of interesting white ones. This is the season for that happening. Once we start to get some fall rains in and they'll, they'll be even more coming out as, as the rains increase, but it's to be expected to, to see the mushrooms come up. And they don't necessarily come up every year, uh, but when conditions are, are right for them, and I have a feeling that that, that sudden temperature change and so on may have, may have stimulated uh, some of them. The mushroom is essentially the, the fruiting body or the flower of uh, the fungus organism, and, and that's a mass of hair-like uh, fibers in the ground. So those, those will come and go as they work on uh, decaying organic matter and that sort of thing in the ground. And that's a sign that you have, at, at least I think, it's a sign you have good soil, right? I mean, that's a good thing. Generally speaking, it is. Uh, although sometimes you may find that uh, uh, you cut down a stump and just kind of buried it over and you get mushrooms coming up in that same spot for the next decade uh, right. every year at the same time. It's not a bad thing. It, it indicates that, you know, there's organisms working on decaying that old stuff. Now, occasionally, we'll find mushrooms that grow in a circle uh, called a fairy ring. The, the fairy ring um, mushrooms are not really a serious problem, but what happens is the mycelia, the, uh, the hairs of the fungus organism that are uh, in the center of that circle will pack fairly tightly and they can cause that circle to not absorb moisture well. And so oftentimes you'll, you'll see the grass uh, dies out in the middle of the ring. And usually the best way to counteract that is to just uh, aerate it and put a wetting agent on that uh, portion of the ground. I have a question, Dale. Last year, I had a uh, Asian pear that the leaves just started turning black and the branch died back. It, it didn't kill the tree, it came back. You know, I just cut that branch off and thought, well, darn. And this year, it's that tree was okay, but it spread to a pear tree next to it and it actually did kill it. Mm -hmm. um, they just turned black. Well, that, that sounds like a, a bacterial dieback. Uh, there's, there's several different disease organisms that, that can attack. It might be a good idea to plan on putting a dormant spray uh, on those uh, a couple of times this winter. And generally anymore, we, we use the, uh, uh, the copper-based dormant sprays, and that, that would be effective on that kind of thing. Lime sulfur would work too, but uh, it's gotten hard for the average person to uh, purchase a reasonable quantity of it. Uh, you can buy a huge quantity of it, but it doesn't keep, and uh, so people have kind of gotten away from it. 
Okay, but just a regular copper spray a couple times during the winter was, should be a good idea. Right, right. After after the foliage has fallen off, but uh, you know, maybe give give it one spray before the first of the year, and then another one before the uh, end of February. Great, great. I have one more question. I'm I'm moving in from out of town where I have no deer, right into like big time deer country, and so I've done <laughs> a lot of research as far as what is resistant. I understand that that it you know in hard times they'll eat anything. Any tips? Um, there's a book that has some excellent lists in it about uh, what plants deer uh, will avoid, what plants deer particularly go for, and how to strategize uh, where, where you put things. It, it's called Deer Proofing Your Yard, and the author's name is ironically Hart, H-A-R-T, which means deer. It, it's a good book that gives some ideas uh, about how to do that. Um, Generally speaking, you'll find some things are, that are particularly attractive to them you may want to avoid. Uh, other things uh, will help keep them away. Uh, deer don't like to be surprised. And so if you've got something that's really fragrant, like uh, fragrant herbs or uh, other fragrant things, it will make it difficult for them to detect a predator sneaking up on them. And so they like to avoid areas that have uh, strongly scented plant material uh, for that reason. So and like plant, planting lavender around something that, that looks a little more appetizing would be a good idea. Yeah, lavender, lavender is, is, is helpful uh, on that sort of thing. It might not be you know, good enough to complete them, keep them away from eating the roses off of a six foot rose bush next right. to the lavender plant, but uh, it, 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 it certainly helps. Th th there's other things that you can do too that will deter them. Uh, there's a uh, device called a uh, scarecrow, which is a motion detecting sprinkler. It just puts out three second burst of water, but it's extremely startling. Uh, I know that because I set one up and managed to walk through it several times myself. And uh, I can assure you that it startles you to no end. Uh, th those are quite effective and you can move them around here and there. And deer just don't like to be uh, uh, surprised like that. So that, that works quite well. But yeah, we definitely have a lot of deer uh, even right here in town. I'm, so I'm transplanting a little over an acre uh, in, that I'm planting, and I'm, I'm bringing over a bunch of plants this week that I want to protect until they get in. But I just put some kind of netting over where the plants are in the pots until I can get them into the ground. Oh, yes. Bird, bird netting is, is helpful to keep. Uh, the, the deer don't like to, to try to nibble through it because the leaves don't fit. And, uh, and it also is helpful for keeping birds from picking fruit that you're trying to save. So right. the, the deer netting would work. Okay, great. Thank you. I voted, noticed we've also have, seem to have a lot of squirrels this fall too. So yes. they've, they've been very busy with the, with the various sundry nuts around my place. So I was happy to see some of the, the silver gray squirrels. Those are the, the big fluffy gray ones. When I was a little kid, my grandpa told me about them and said that we used to have them, but they all died out of plague. And you can see a few of the state fairgrounds and, and the, the capital grounds in Salem, but uh, there weren't, weren't any out here in the country. But they, they've made a comeback over the, the past 50 years. So I've got several different types of squirrels now running about the place. Is that a, a concern as far as your plants go? Besides the fact that they're putting nuts in the pots? <laughs> yeah, I mean, they, 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 and of course, I have the blue jays that'll do that for me too. Uh, but uh, yeah, they. I've never really had much difficulty with, with squirrels, but I have had people report that uh, they steal tomatoes and uh, dig up uh, bulbs and dig up transplants and that sort of thing. So uh, they, they can be a nuisance. I have a couple squirrels that live in, and I've seen their big squirrel nest. It's kind of crazy when the leaves have fallen, come and fallen off the trees. And this little, these little gray squirrels, he has the craziest little tail. It's not, he, you know, it's not real bushy, but it just, he comes over and sits on the fence and talks to me. And uh, about two months ago, all of a sudden there was this beautiful big brown squirrel showed up in the back area. And I thought it was so interesting to see the difference between them. So the two little gray squirrels were on one tree, and the big brown one was over here and they were just chattering away at each other. And, uh, you know, and you don't see, I don't see that many brown squirrels anymore. Is that common or uncommon or? Uh, that, I think that's the fox squirrel you're uh -huh. talking about. And I've, I've got though I've kind of had them all along, but right. it's the 
the big fluffy gray ones that uh, have have made the comeback. Huh. Yeah, mm -hmm. I've had the gray guys in my backyard for quite a while. Yeah, and of course that's the one that they're complaining about over in the United Kingdom because they, they took our silver gray squirrels over there and released them into a park or something, and now they're uh, displacing the uh, the the native red squirrel of uh, of Great Britain. So wow, who would have thought? So is this like a bumper year for moles and gophers for anybody else? They, they <laughs> seem to have become quite active lately. And uh, it, it's probably partly because the, uh, uh, the recent rains have, have stimulated uh, the soil insects and worms and so forth. But yeah, I'm seeing a lot of, uh, uh, of mole hills uh, about the place now. I've actually seen a lot more mice. My house over on uh, Whittier backs up to the alley that used to have the train tracks through behind between Whittier, Milltown, and Silvertown. And it's just all wild now. But um, we, for some reason, have been getting a lot of mice. And my cat, I got a kitten just because of this. And seriously, she caught two just last night. I don't even know where they're coming from. But in the last couple of weeks, she's caught five. And... Uh, you think if they know they're being caught, they wouldn't be coming in somewhere, but <laughs> it just seems like a lot more mice this year, too. Yeah, it, it, it could be. I've, I've got a lot of voles, which are, they're, they're like a big mouse with a short tail. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the, the cats have been catching lots of those lately, too. So in general, it was a pretty good year. We had uh, a fair amount of moisture fairly late in the season. So food supplies of various things were quite well. Uh, it appears that most of the grass is set seed well and uh, mixed bag on fruit trees, but in, in general, a lot of things are doing quite well. So I suspect that the rodents just had lots of good things to eat this year. Do you have any tips on moles and gophers besides traps, which I, I have not been successful with traps, although I, I, my understanding is the only way to deal with them. Traps really probably are the best way. Uh, it sort of depends on your your area and, and what you've got there. Uh, if you're if you have areas that you can chase them away into, there is a castor oil-based uh, granular repellent that is uh, uh, moderately effective on them as well. But uh, the only thing that, that really seems to be uh, completely effective is the trapping. That's what the the grass seed farmers do. They have uh, contractors that come out and, and just trap the grass seed fields for the road. Yeah. And, and if there's some other way that was more effective, they'd be using that. So now my recommendation is, is get a trap that you're comfortable with, really learn how it works, how to, how to set it and, you know, play around with it a bit. There, there's several different ones that are quite popular. I'm, I'm partial to the one that's called the out of sight mole trap because it works from both directions when you put it in the runway. It has two sets of jaws, uh, and they're, they're, they seem to be reasonably priced compared to the uh, the cinch type trap. At least, at least pound for pound, they're a whole lot cheaper. Where do you find those? Uh, Wilco has has them. Do they out of sight I'm, traps? I'm pretty sure that Ace Hardware does too. Now I just gotta find somebody else to do it. I'm afraid of those traps. Yeah. Yeah, well, the, the, the out of sight comes with a couple of cocking levers, and so you can cock them uh, with the handles, and it's got a, it has a safety catch and, and so forth. So they're reasonably safe and, and simple to work with, but again, they're, they're definitely startling. Will that out of sight work for both moles and gophers? Yes, uh, unless it's a really huge gopher, but it, it's, it's quite a sturdy trap, and uh, it's generally effective on anything that we have as a lawn type. Uh, pest. Out in the fields, you maybe you occasionally come across ground squirrels that are too big for them, but uh, the, the gophers and moles that we get in the lawns, and, and by far the majority of what we have in lawns around town are the, uh, uh, it's a mole called the Townsend's mole, which is the, the largest mole of North America. Mm. Lucky us. Yeah. <laughs> so would that work for mice too, or? No, mice, yeah. mice are way too small for, and this kind of works as, uh, as a burrowing animal comes through, it's pushing a, a line of a small amount of dirt ahead of it, and that, that sets off the trigger, and, the, and then the, 
then the jaws from whichever group, you know, both directions go off. So, Dodi, I have uh, just this year discovered we have mice. Uh, the traps, the, the sticky things. So it's not a trap that's going to snap on it. Well, we found one uh, kind of a trap, and it did work. We did get a couple of mice from it, and it was more like um, like a like a toilet paper roll size, and it had like a little lever on it, like a little guillotine is what I'm thinking. And the <laughs> mouse goes in, and 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 it, and it I think it sets it off. Because all that you see is the tail coming out the other end, and uh, the mouse is there. So I just pick the whole thing up with gloves and throw the whole thing out. But um, probably not supposed to do that. But um, it's been really um, pretty effective and quiet. You know, I, my granddaughter is seven, and I really, you know, it's one thing to see the cat throwing a dead mouse around. It's another trying to get one out of a trap. You know. I'm as as far as regular mouse traps go, there's one called the snappy trap that I like. Yeah. It's it looks a lot like a regular mouse trap, but they're they're simplified. You can you can set them with one hand, uh, and they're a lot easier to work with. But again, it, it's like a regular regular mouse trap as right. far as what you have when you got the dead mouse in it. So. Yeah, yeah. The one thing I liked about this one is truly you don't see anything except the tail. And spiders, yeah, we all freak over spiders. We have so many different kinds of spiders; it's crazy. Most of the spiders we have around here are beneficial, but mm -hmm. they, they can be kind of messy. But. We just don't like them in the house, that's all. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, if, you, if you've got a few cellar spiders in the house, you're going to have less of the other household type pests. Uh, a cellar spider is the one that sometimes gets called daddy long legs. It, it oh, looks uh -huh. like a harvestman, which is sometimes think of as the real daddy long legs outdoors. But the cellar spider actually is a... Uh, a true spider mm -hmm. uh, and uh, makes kind of a, a messy little web in the corner. It was, and actually in abandoned rooms, they can fill half the room with their web too. They, really? Wow. But, uh, but they're, they're one of the, and they'll, they'll kill much larger uh, spiders and, uh, and other, other things mm -hmm. that are pesty around the home. So I, I generally leave those guys alone when I come across them. Right. I was just going to ask about it at this season as far as doing, you know, what, when we're uh, transplanting plants or trying to buy things, do you have any tips? Well, this is, this is one of the very best times for transplanting and planting out into the, uh, the garden. The, the ground is still warm and will stay warm for uh, quite some time into the winter, so you can get a good root system developed uh, before next summer comes along. So plants that have issues with dryness have a much better chance with a fall transplanting than uh, a spring transplanting. The, the temperatures are going to be fine for several months yet for, uh, for general planting. Now, if it's something that's a borderline tropical that you're, you're kind of uh, pushing your zones on it, those are better off to wait and plant those in the spring. But if it's something that's reasonably hardy around here, this is one of the very best times uh, for planting. Now, I recommend uh, maybe fertilizing with uh, relatively low nitrogen uh, if you're doing it before we've had much freezing weather because you don't want to stimulate uh, uh, new growth on the plant uh, in the fall that'll then be uh, frost damaged. But uh, the phosphorus and potassium, uh, the, the second two numbers on your fertilizer are not going to be uh, stimulating uh, the new growth. Something slow, like uh, I use uh, alfalfa pellets as my slow nitrogen, and putting them on now is not because they're not going to be giving out much of any nutrient until it's already gotten uh, cold enough that the, the leaves won't develop. And many plants are able to pick up nutrient during the winter from their roots, and so they're kind of preloaded and ready to take off in the spring. That's great. Do, can you get the alfalfa pellets at Wilco? Yes, uh, they. It, it's an animal feed. Uh, but it's, it's what I use as, as my slow uh, uh, nitrogen in most all of my, gar my container gardening and, and also out in the ground. Uh, and they're, they're, it's similar in what they recommend as alfalfa meal. Uh, rose growers for years have uh, sworn by alfalfa meal, but I've discovered that the pellets are actually cheaper and easier to work with than the, than the meal. So get the pellets and you can just toss them around and uh, and spread them and so forth. And now we have, you know, as you know, uh, our native soil tends to be a pretty heavy clay. Um, and I'm moving into town into a development with very heavy clay, rocky soil. 
and we ed we ended up with a huge pile of uh, topsoil. I'm going to put that in quotes because it's just sand. I did the water test on it. It's got maybe 10 percent something else and the rest is sand. Uh, and then I started mm -hmm. doing some reading and it says if you mix that with your clay soil, you will be making cement. Technically, yes, it, it can happen that way. Uh, you've got soil particle sizes, and, and if you've got a lot of really fine particles, and then you give them a, a, a medium-sized particle that then they can pack in the spaces in between them, that can uh, create a, uh, a, a compacting material. But in general, in the garden, because of biological activity and working in other organic matter type things, uh, various compost, peat moss, uh, Harvest Supreme, that kind of thing being worked into the soil will uh, aid in, in what we call the, the structure of the soil. And so that keeps these particles uh, somewhat separated and creates air spaces through them, gives nutrient for the earthworms and other things that go through. And so it, you have a mixture of soil particle sizes, but because of the biological material, it doesn't pack into the, uh, uh, the concrete. On the other hand, if like early in the spring, if, if you've got clay soil that's just really, really uh, soggy and you try to root fill in a bunch of uh, organic matter into it, that, that's kind of the process for making adobe. And so you don't want to, you don't want to work the heavy clay soil when it's saturated uh, so that you force the air out of it. Oh, okay. That's really good to know. There's a problem with topsoil and that is that it's not well defined. Uh, any soil that comes off the top of the surface is declared <laughs> topsoil, regardless of whether they took 30 feet of good stuff off before they got down to this stuff. You kind of have to uh, play it by ear. And generally speaking, when you're purchasing um, something like this, and, unless you're just looking for fill to, to fill in, you know, serious low spot kind of thing, but generally you want to get a combination that, that's a mixture of topsoil and usually manures or something else that has uh, been mixed in with it. And that way you've got the organic matter already uh, in place. That's some great information, Dale. You're just yeah. a wealth of, wealth of information. Any other questions for Dale today? Well, here, I'll ask one. And I know you all, all you gardening people will probably laugh at me. Um, I understand that this time of year, it's a good time to dig up your bulbs and then winter them over and then plant them again? Is that? It kind of depends on what we're talking about. So uh, true bulbs, uh, generally speaking, uh, put up foliage in, in the spring and blossoms in the spring. And uh, then they, they store their energy so they can come out and put on a big show early uh, uh -huh. before, before other things. Uh, that'd be your, your daffodils, tulips, and that sort of thing. Right. I suppose you, you could dig them up if you knew where they were right now, but generally speaking, it's better to dig them up just as the foliage is dying so that you can find them. And uh, they, can, they can be replanted at that time or they can be kept in a cool, dry place and replanted about now. Mm -hmm. Now, the other group of things that we sometimes call bulbs, things like dahlias and glads, and begonias and so forth. Uh, these are things that uh, may or may not need winter protection, but we dig them for, for several reasons. But you know, dahlias we dig up because they can freeze out unless they're planted deeply in the ground. And they also get huge if you don't divide them every so often. And it, it's a way to get new plants. Now, if you want to perennialize a dahlia, we can do that around here because our ground generally does not freeze very deeply. And so, what you do that in, in the spring when you plant your dahlia out, you, you dig an extra deep hole and you plant it down in that hole um, and the top of the tuber wants to be a good foot down. But you only cover it over a few inches uh, at planting time. Then later on that summer you fill in the hole and you now have a strong tuber that's down right. below the frost line and uh, it will uh, it'll come through the winter. If we have a brutal winter, you might lose them. But, uh, we haven't had a very hard winter in, in quite a while now, so we may be over them. Uh, <clears throat> the, the downside of this is that the plant gets quite a bit bigger than uh, you ordinarily would expect. I, I remember a neighbor I had in Portland that had one like this, that uh, it was just uh, one red dahlia, but it grew as big as a rhododendron every year. It was, <laughs> 
it was four feet tall and six feet across, and it was, it was just huge. Uh, gladiolus are perfectly hardy around here, but if you plant them in the ground and leave them there, they all bloom at the same time uh, the following year. And so the theory is if you're wanting to really use gladiolus in flower arranging and that kind of thing is you'll dig them up in the fall. And then in the spring, uh, about the last frost, you start planting them and plant them at two week intervals, uh, clear up until early summer, and then you'll get them blooming at uh, two week intervals throughout the, uh, the growing season. Uh, begonias uh, almost never survive our winters outdoors, so uh, we need to save their tubers uh, indoors in a, in a, a cool, slightly moist uh, environment. Some people store them in an old refrigerator. Uh, some people store them in a, you know, an attached but unheated garage to keep them above freezing, but to keep them cool. And then around uh, the uh, beginning of February, you, you put them in uh, trays of peat moss and start misting them and uh, let, let the foliage come out. When the begonia grows, uh, the leaves are shaped sort of like Africa or South America. Mm -hmm. And the blossom is going to come out based on the orientation of those leaves. And so mm -hmm. you want to plant it with the point, the, the capes, you know, Cape of Good Hope or um, Cape Horn, you want those pointing out the, and the blossoms will come out pointing that direction. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, another trick when you're planting uh, tulips in a uh, flower pot for uh, sourcing, a tulip is kind of shaped like a uh, chocolate chip, but it has mm -hmm. one side that is slightly flatter than the other side. And that flatter side is the side that you want to have facing the edge of the pot because the first leaf is going to come out that direction. And so they'll get uh, a more balanced looking uh, plant and foliage for, for forcing tulips in the pot. This is a good gardening season. We're, we're coming up on it. And uh, a number of the, uh, the local garden centers are, are offering, uh, you know, socially distance shopping and that sort of thing. So some of the, some of the big garden things didn't happen, but some of the others are, are still going on. So check with a lot of the local nurseries. There, there's stuff, stuff still happening. I'm just going to ask about pruning. That We really don't prune until the spring, right? It depends on the plant. Um, you generally want to uh, figure out how does this plant bloom and try to avoid minim minimizing the cutting off of those blooms. So <clears throat> lots of things that set their flower buds well in advance, typically things that bloom in the spring, uh, you want to prune those uh, fairly shortly after their bloom time. But other plants that bloom on both old and new wood can pretty much be pruned uh, at any time. I kind of like for a lot of pruning just to wait until after the foliage has dropped off so that you can see the structure and, uh, mm -hmm. and tell what you're doing and you know cut off what you need to cut off and leave what you need to leave. Uh, but that's, that's primarily for visibility purposes. And of course you, you kind of got to study your plants and so forth. Some plants um, a lot of perennials, you can just cut them back in the fall and they're, they're perfectly happy. Some others, uh, like the hyssops, you know, the stems have died and they're not going to come back, but the plant stores a lot of vitality in those stems over winter. And so you don't want to cut those stems until new foliage starts to appear in the spring. You kind of learn as you go. And, and, and the plants have never read the books and so they don't always behave the way they're supposed to either. So. <laughs> So I'm pruning clematis. It's always been a mystery to me. Um, just because, you know, it's like I buy it and then of course I forget what pruning group it's in, but I'm just gonna run this by you. So if it blooms early, you, you prune it in the fall. If it blooms late, you prune it in the spring? Kind of. Uh, <clears throat> there's two kind of major categories. There's ones that have one big, extended bloom period, typically spring into summer, like the classic Jack when I purple. And those, you just cut them all the way back in the fall. There's others that typically they'll, they'll bloom early, they'll quit for a while and then bloom again, or they may only bloom late. Those tend to be blooming on old wood and those plants you don't want to prune back very uh, much at all, not, not even in the spring. You just do a little bit of guidance pruning on that type of clematis. My theory was just leave it alone and let it do whatever it's going to do, but then you end up with a bunch of dead stems. Right. If you don't prune the ones that have the, the single bloom time, the, the Jackman eye type, 
If you don't prune, prune them, you're gonna wind up with 10 foot of dead stem at the bottom, and then all the flowers are 20, 30 feet up in them. And so those do need to be back just to keep the plant in, uh, in proper form and, and down to size. So yeah, clematis are a little bit tricky and you kind of got to study on them. The main thing is the, the late bloomers and the twice bloomers just want uh, a very light pruning on them. And the ones that have one big uh, bloom time, but it's just that one big time, uh, those you prune all the way back to like maybe a foot tall. We had a clematis speaker who was fabulous. And so I had to go out and get every kind of clematis I could find. And I managed to find some that were quite invasive. Yes, uh, the, the autumn clematis is one of our main in, invasive uh, plants around here uh, anymore. Uh, they don't bloom particularly uh, showy either. Uh, there's a lot of different kinds of clematis. Some of them are uh, not even vines. I've got one that's uh, more or less an upright uh, herbaceous perennial, dies to the ground, and then it grows up about three feet tall with kind of purpley. Uh, foliage and uh, clusters of little white flowers, sort of like that autumn uh, clematis. It's, it's not outstanding, but it's an interesting plant being a clematis that isn't a vine. As far as like containing the ones that are, uh, like the one, I, the, I have two that, uh, one I totally dug out, the other I don't think I can handle digging it out. Is there, I guess you just pull them as they come up? Yeah, and you want to make sure that you don't, the, these invasive ones, you want to make sure you don't let them uh, uh, set seed either. So uh, if they bloom, cut the flowers off as soon as they're done, if, if not as soon as you see them. But uh, yeah, if you've got one of the invasive ones, you kind of want to go after it. Whenever you, whenever you can see it, go after it and you, you'll eventually uh, uh, get them out. But uh, it, it is a very large plant family and lots and lots of nice ones in it. But there, there's some oddballs in there that you kind of want to be careful of too. So composting might be something people are interested in at this season too, because we're getting ready to get rid of a lot of stuff that the garden has gotten done with. Mm -hmm. And so um, composting is an excellent way to deal with that. Uh, generally speaking, the materials should be chopped up a little bit, like whole corn stalks take a while to break down, but if you can uh, chop them up a little bit and put them in, um, they make an excellent uh, addition to the compost. Uh, almost all of our uh, yard materials can, can go into that. One exception would be walnut leaves. Uh, walnuts have a chemical, it's used as a survival mechanism so that weeds don't compete with the walnuts, but uh, a lot of plants do not like the chemical juglone, which is uh, the chemical in walnuts. And so uh, if you have walnut trees, save that foliage for some, you can actually use it kind of as a, a, a mild uh, weed suppressor around plants that are tolerant of it. Uh, you'd want to go online and re research out, you know, what, what can tolerate uh, the uh, the walnut leaves and what can't. What about oak leaves? Oak leaves are kind of borderline. I, I think they're fine in the compost pile, but they do have a, a high level of tannins. And so if you had compost that was, you know, 95% oak leaves, that would be uh, a, a somewhat uh, plant suppressing mulch, which is not a bad thing. I and mean, if you used it around mature shrubs, uh, it would help with uh, some weed control. But if you're, you're trying to uh, create ideal compost to improve your vegetable garden soil or something, uh, you'd want to mix in some additional materials with oak leaves to, to make the best compost. I think our hour is just about up. Okay, I guess we're planning on it again in two weeks. And then, yes. And then we'll take a hiatus for the, uh, for the winter. Right. Everybody <laughs> have a great afternoon and thank you for joining us.